All right, this PowerPoint presentation will correlate with chapter two and also with chapter four in the Explorations textbook and also chapter two and chapter four in the Essentials textbook. So in this PowerPoint, we're going to go over some of the basics of Darwin's theory of evolution. So let's talk a little bit about natural selection first. So Charles Darwin studied finches living on the Galapagos Island and he recognized that all of these finches look similar, however, also had variations and differences. They had different beak sizes, different colorations, and he realized that these finches must have been descendants from a single common ancestor. So these finches are adapted to survive in very specific niches or environmental roles within their island environment through a process called adaptive radiation that we'll talk about here more in just a moment. So Darwin developed his theory of evolution. So it was a theory of descent with modification. So he coined the idea of natural selection. So it's based on the concept that individuals with preferential characteristics will inevitably survive and reproduce at higher rates in comparison to individuals that do not possess those traits. So for example, if you think about um, let's use the rock pocket mouse. So the rock pocket mouse has different colorations. There's one form that has a light sandy color, and then there's one form of the rock pocket mouse that has a dark gray, almost blackish color. So if the rock pocket mouse is trying to survive in the southwestern desert, um, trying to blend in with sand, obviously it would be more beneficial for that mouse to have the sandy brown color because they're able to blend in with the sand to avoid predators like hawks and eagles. Um, but the characteristics that are beneficial may depend upon the environmental circumstances. So um, for example, there was a volcanic eruption and after that lava flow dried, the substrate was now dark gray, blackish in color. So all of a sudden, the rock pocket mouse, the, the advantageous coloration is now the dark gray, the dark gray blackish color because they're able to blend in with the substrate. So what's beneficial in one environment may not be beneficial in another. That's important to keep in mind. So adaptations, a few vocab words to get out of the way here. Adaptations, these are changes in physical structure, function, or behavior that allow an organism or a species to survive and reproduce in a given environment. So these adaptations in the finches, we're looking at different beak sizes and colorations. So the finches that have the really long skinny beaks like this one here, um, they have um, an adaptation to that allows them to pull nectar from flowers. Whereas the finch that has a really short stout beak, they have an adaptation that allows them to break open uh, seeds. So when you think about it, that's advantageous to every every organism, or at least every finch here in this example, because if they're all trying to eat the same food type, then they're going to come into direct competition with one another. And that may mean that fewer finches are able to survive if they're all trying to eat the same food type. But if some finches are eating seeds, some are eating nectar from flowers, some are eating uh, fruits, you know, you guys get the idea. If they're all eating primarily different types of foods, then they're not coming into direct competition with one, with one another as often. Um, they may also have different times of the day where they're active. Some may be active more in the morning, some may be active in the evening, some may be active in the afternoon. Um, you know, some organisms are, are even nocturnal. Uh, so this idea of adaptive radiation is actually beneficial for every organism in that given habitat. So, in this diagram here, you see the founder species is down here at the bottom. So again, envisioning that tree or braided delta image of evolution instead of the linear fashion. So each one of these branches is representing a speciation event. So all of these finches share a common ancestry. However, they have gone through adaptive radiation and speciation events um, that allow them to be specifically adapted to certain environmental roles. So adaptive radiation is the diversification of an ancestral group of organisms into new forms that are adapted to specific environmental niches or roles. So in the island environment, we see dozens of different species of finches that are all specifically adapted to certain circumstances, which is again beneficial to all of them so that they don't come into direct competition with one another. 
All right, so Darwin viewed evolution as simple biological change from generation to generation. And later on in chapter four, we will learn how to calculate genotypic frequencies from generation to generation using an equation called the Hardy-Weinberg equation. Um, Darwin's theories on evolution were quite controversial, uh, predominantly due to the religious doctrine of the time. Um, since many religious doctrines suggest that the planet is thousands of years old instead of billions, and religious doctrines suggest that a creator created all organisms on the planet in their, in their current form. So Darwin particularly faced backlash and controversy regarding the evolution of humans. All right, so the next few slides are gonna talk about some of the disciplines that influenced Darwin. Um, Alfred Russell Wallace contacted Darwin in 1858 with a set of ideas very similar to Darwin's. So both men independently talked about this concept, this theory of evolution via natural selection, and Darwin was concerned that Wallace may gain credit for the idea. So that influenced Darwin to, um, to publish his book on the origin of species. All right, so evolution may occur gradually over time. So if the environment is changing gradually, then organisms will also respond by adapting gradually. So that may be also called phyletic gradualism. Um, if the environment changes more rapidly or if there's a major cataclysmic event, it may um, force organisms to adapt and evolve more quickly or die out. So more rapid and speciation events, those are called punctuated equilibrium. Uh, so some common misconceptions, humans share a common ancestor with chimpanzees and other primates. However, humans did not evolve from chimpanzees. So it's important to kind of erase that image, that linear image of a chimpanzee on one side and a bipedal human on the other, uh, because that's not how evolution works. I want you to envision evolution as branching events, as a very bushy, complicated tree, or as a braided delta. Another common misconception, the theory of evolution is often disregarded simply due to the term theory. Um, but as, you, as those of you in my lab are learning, in order to become a scientific theory, it means that it started out as a hypothesis and was repeatedly tested utilizing the scientific method and proven to be, or at least supported, by the scientific method and evidence. So there is quite a bit of evidence for evolution that we will go through throughout the semester. There's fossil evidence, paleonto paleontological evidence, geological evidence, and of course we can even use math to prove evolution. Um, so we'll learn more about that in chapter four. So a hypothesis will only become a scientific theory after, after it has been tested repeatedly and proven to be supported by multiple researchers, multiple settings. All right, so evolution, if we're looking for a definition, evolution is essentially fluctuations in gene frequencies from generation to generation. So a gene frequency is the number of genes in a population that exist for each form of a trait. So for example, in, in the next couple chapters, we'll look at things like blood type, um, attached to your lobes versus free hanging, uh, the ability to roll your tongue or the inability to roll your tongue, et cetera, et cetera. So we're going to look at some very simple, what we call monohybrid Punnett squares to help get the idea of what we mean by a gene frequency. So a selective advantage, if a certain trait is beneficial to the individual in a given environment, it is more likely to become more common because if, if that individual possesses the beneficial trait, Let's say we're talking about the rock pocket mouse, and let's say they're living on the sandy desert. So the mice that have the gene that codes for the sandy brown coloration in the fur, those mice are going to be more likely to survive and therefore more likely to reproduce. So that means that those genes are going to be passed along to future generation. Whereas the pocket mouse that has the black coloration in this example, they're going to be more likely to be swooped up by a predator like a hawk or an eagle. So they will be less likely to then pass along their genetic material to future generations. So that over time, what that means is the beneficial traits will increase in a given population, whereas the detrimental traits will over time decrease. All right, so there are four forces of evolution. We actually are going to go into this in much more detail once we get to chapter four, but we're just kind of introducing the idea here in this chapter. So the four forces that will influence evolutionary change 
our mutations. So mutations are any random change in the genetic material. It's actually the only source of brand new genetic material within a gene pool. Um, gene flow, another way to look at that is migration of genes. So it's a result of migration or admixture. It's the exchange of genes between two populations. So if you envision population A with 500 individuals and population B with 500 individuals, gene flow just means that population A and B are completely interbreeding, swapping their genes, and it's creating cohesiveness, genetic cohesiveness within those two groups. Um, genetic drift, there's two different types that we'll talk about. There's the founder effect and the bottleneck effect. So don't worry about that too much in this chapter. We're going to go into that in much more detail in chapter four. But for now, just know it's a random change or a random sampling error. And then natural selection, we've already talked about a little bit. It's probably one that most of you are familiar with even before taking this class. So again, it's that idea that individuals with favorable traits will be more likely to survive and reproduce. Therefore, their genes are going to increase in that given population. All right, so the next few slides are going to talk about the disciplines. There's five scientific disciplines that influenced Charles Darwin in developing his theory of evolution via natural selection. So this slide just lists the disciplines and then we'll talk about them in more detail. So the five disciplines are geology, paleontology, taxonomy and systematics, demography, and evolutionary biology. All right, so let's talk first about geology. So James Hutton was among the first to study natural forces such as wind, rain, and erosion, and he calculated the age of the earth to be millions of years old. Um, we now know based on more solid geological evidence that the earth is about 4.6 billion years old. Uh, James Hutton came up with the theory of uniformitarianism. So this is the idea that the natural processes that operate today, such as wind, water erosion, flooding, volcanoes, earthquakes, etc., are the same as the natural processes that happened in the past. So what that means is if we understand how something like water erosion affects the Grand Canyon, then we can calculate the age of the earth if we understand how that process works. All right, so Charles Lyell was a student of Hutton, of Hutton's. Um, he utilized Hutton's theory of uniformitarianism, and he proposed that the various aspects of the Earth's surface are variable through time, but the underlying processes that influence them are constant. So he proposed that the Earth must be significantly older than previously proposed. So we now know, based on more sophisticated dating technologies, geological, paleontological evidence, that the Earth is approximately 4.6 billion years old. So the great age of the Earth was a radical theory in Darwin's time. Again, going back to those religious doctrines that suggest that the Earth is thousands of years old instead of billions. Um, but it is very possible, at least in my opinion, it is very possible to negotiate a belief in the theory of evolution and in religion, spirituality, as long as you have an open mind about the time frame. Um, for example, the time frame out, outlined in religious texts may be merely hypothetical. Maybe a thousand years really represents a billion. Um, so as long as you have a, an open mind about the time frame of how this all occurred, I think it is certainly possible to believe in evolution and also be spiritual. But we'll talk more about that throughout the semester. All right, so let's talk next, next about paleontology. So paleontology is a study of fossil remains. Here in this class, we'll mainly be doing human paleontology, so the study of human fossils. Um, Robert Hooke tested the idea that fossils were the remains of ancient life by studying the microscopic structure of wood. Um, he found that fossil wood had, an, had a structure that is identical to that of living trees. And from that, Hooke concluded that fossil wood must have once come from living trees. Um, so a very basic idea, but the idea that the fossil record is going to allow us to study the process of evolution, because we can look at organisms that lived millions of years ago. Um, George Cuvier is a French naturalist. He studied anatomy and structural makeup, and he applied his knowledge of compared anatomy to fossils. So his studies demonstrated that fossils found in geographic strata were actually the remains of animals that have gone extinct. And he hypothesized that certain species may have gone extinct due to environmental catastrophe. So he came up with this doctrine called catastrophism. 
So catastrophism is the doctrine asserting that cataclysmic events such as volcanoes, earthquakes, and floods, rather than evolutionary processes, are responsible for geologic changes throughout Earth's history. So he's partially correct. I mean, of course, sometimes cataclysmic events do influence the evolutionary change in organisms. Like, for example, I'm sure many of you have heard that one of the big theories on how the dinosaurs became extinct is that there was a major um, asteroid that hit the Earth that, um, you know, that completely disturbed the sediment. The sediment all went into the atmosphere and blocked out the sun. Um, once the sediment blocked out the sun, of course, the plants were no longer able to go through photosynthesis, so the plants eventually died out. And then once the plants died out, the herbivores, the plant eaters that were dependent upon them for food then died out. And then once the herbivores died out, then the carnivores started to die out. So that influenced a major extinction event, uh, but that also um, opened up all of these roles, opened up all these environmental niches for the mammals to, um, to adaptively radiate into those environmental roles. So sometimes cataclysmic events do influence in evolutionary change in organisms, but that's not always the case. Evolution will occur over time, gradually, even if there isn't a cataclysmic major event. All right, let's go ahead and pause here. I'm gonna to try to keep these video clips short and sweet for you guys, about 15 minutes. So let's go ahead and pause here. So if you need to take a break and then we'll continue on with this PowerPoint.